Good day, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Anin, Bojo, Miigwech. Welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming to our session. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci d'être venu ici. We are conducting a session this morning entitled Teaching for Global Citizenship, Social Justice, and Peace Through International Partnerships. And what we're exploring is a collaboration between Canada and the United States in terms of teaching and education around global citizenship. We're looking to see if it's possible, and if so, how to teach a complex topic like global citizenship in an era of nationalism, of expanding conflict, of environmental degradation, in a way that promotes peace, social justice, and decolonization. So we're coming together with a group of former colleagues and, uh, and a brand new colleague, the co-investigators of this team, um, became friends and colleagues during their doctoral time at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. And I'm referring to Dr. Leanne Ingram, Dr. Solomon Belay, and our new colleague, uh, Claudio Flores Moreno. Um, we have taken different paths since our um, doctoral work, and we've reunited to put together this project that we're going to tell you about over the course of the next, next hour. So without further ado, I will pass to Dr. Ingram to introduce herself and we'll introduce the rest of the team. Hola, good morning, bonjour, miigwech, and annyeong for our Korean colleagues. Um, I'm Dr. Leanne Ingram. Um, I was actually born in Côte d'Ivoire. So um, je suis africaine en fait, um, that was a joke. Um, and I did my uh, master's at Harvard University in international education and my doctoral work, as Gary said, at OISE. I now teach um, both at OISE and at Lakehead University. And um, I'm really uh, happy to be here with all of you today. And I'll pass it over to Solomon. Hello, uh, good mo uh, good afternoon for Ethiopia. I know uh, other places there are different time scales. And I'm not Darachu, and I'm Harik. Anyways, my name is Dr. Salaman Balai. I was born and raised in Ethiopia, except uh, the brief time I lived in Canada, where I did my PhD in the University of Toronto with my two colleagues, Leanne and uh, Gary. And now uh, I am at the University teaching courses on curriculum studies. Indigenous knowledge, indigenous knowledge and uh, uh, active learning and the uh, College of Education in the Department of Science and Mathematics Education. Thank you. Thanks, Solomon. Um, buenos dias a todas, a todos. Mi nombre es Claudia Flores Moreno. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour. Um, I am Claudia Flores Moreno. I am a PhD student at Lakehead University. I took my master's education at the Institute of Education, London University, uh, a while ago, and I am thrilled to have joined this team. Thank you, Claudia. I see Dr. Waldi has just joined us as well. And uh, thank you, Dr. Waldi. I'm glad you could get in. Dr. Waldi is our research assistant in, uh, in Addis Ababa. And would you like to take um, a few seconds to introduce yourself as well, Dr. Waldi? Thank you, Gary. Um, Dr. Olde from Addis Ababa University, the Department of Science and Mathematics Education, um, serving the department as assistant professor. And I am part of this project as a research assistant. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And my name is Gary Plume. I'm an assistant professor at Lakehead University in the Faculty of Education in Orillia. I'm interested in the intersections between local place-based education and international critical global citizenship education. So as we described before, our project is investigating uh, global citizenship and social justice um, and peace through international partnerships. Um, throughout our presentation today, there's a number of themes we look to come to. So we're going to give you a broad overview of the theory uh, and the uh, mechanics of our project. We'll talk about a pilot study that we conducted through 2023. 
And then our upcoming uh, project in 2024 and 2025, for which we received a grant by the um, by the funding, Canadian funding agency, SHIRC. Um, we'll conclude our presentation, and then our goal is to leave some good time for questions and discussion. Um, to facilitate some of our discussion, we've also prepared a Jamboard um, in the spirit of the pedagogy of this project. So you'll see this, how we use Jamboard in our, in our international online project. So what we'd encourage you to do, if there's any questions that you have or contributions, feel free to add it to this Jamboard throughout our presentation. If you haven't used Jamboard, all you need to do is go to the link that I'm providing in the chat right now and just go into the Jamboard and you can use um, some of the features that you'll see on the left side of the screen over here to be able to post your questions or post-it notes or emojis or anything else in the Jamboard. If you do have a question of clarification, then feel free to interject, but we'll try and keep the other questions towards the end of the project. Uh, the end of the present presentation, I should say. Um, and then finally, in terms of our um, discussion for today, um, as you can see, we have a multilingual panel and also in the theme and the spirit of the conference, we're happy to address questions across some of our languages that we're more fluent in, such as Amharic, Spanish, French, and English. So for our project, there are two main sites. Um, one is in, uh, in Canada uh, at Lakehead University in Aurelia. And for those of you that are not as familiar with Ontario geography, we're about an hour, an hour and a half north by car of uh, Toronto, Ontario. We're on the shores of Lake Simcoe. Um, it's, uh, it's a beautiful um, area of lakes and forests. Um, Lake Simcoe is not one of the Great Lakes, but it's one of the major lakes here. We're several weeks past our fall equinox um, in the world. And, uh, and so in Canada, that means our leaves are turning uh, different colors. So it's a beautiful time here. This uh, gorgeous territories has been, have been the ancestral home of the Anishinaabe people that have lived here for many generations in our territories. This includes the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi peoples, um, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Uh, for several centuries, the Wendat peoples lived in these territories as well, and they all served as caretakers for these lands. Um, and in this setting, we are in our multicultural and uh, multi-historical um, communities we're working towards uh, living together and creating a future um, through reconciliation, through trust, uh, and through other uh, reciprocal relationships. So that's a little bit about one part, um, one location of the project. I'm going to turn it over to you, Solomon, to tell us a little bit about the location um, of Addis Ababa University. Uh so, uh, as you might know, Ethiopia is located in East Africa, uh, called, it was part of Horn of Africa, and the Addis Ababa University is the oldest and the biggest uh, university in Ethiopia. Uh, Addis Ababa means new flower, uh, taken from the, which took its name from the, the city itself. And uh, as you know, Ethiopia is an ancient country that has a history of at least 3,000 years of statehood. It's mentioned, of course, in both in the Bible and the Quran and also other major holy books. Uh, interestingly, of course, it was the only country in Africa which was never physically colonized. It is now, of course, colonized through education, which is a colonization of the mind. So this colonization manifested through identity disorder, self-hate, civil war, displacement, starvation, the spread of disease, you know, inflation, you know, so many types of problems. So uh, this global citizen education came through at the right time. Uh, thank you, Gary. So um, we wanted to situate the rationale for our project in some of the current um, conflicts that are plaguing our world right now and dominating global media. Um, including the Russia 
Ukraine conflict, the um, rapidly expanding and changing conflict in the Middle East. And then also the conflict which is burdening our Ethiopian colleagues. And we asked this question to all of us to kind of contemplate as a provocative question or a question for us to think about. Which one of these conflicts or which of these conflicts do you see in your media feed on a daily basis? And which one you do not see? Um, and this is a good question for us to frame our um, approach and our project to adopting a critical approach or a decolonial approach to global citizenship education in light of the way that our global media covers the world in an unequal way. So um, I thought that we'd start with something like this to help us frame and give you an insight into our thinking on why critical approaches to global citizenship education. So we'll go to the next slide. So our rationale um, when we first sort of conceptualized this project was the fact that we noticed or we observed that teacher education to a large degree takes a nationalistic perspective most often, that uh, we're preparing teachers to help their students learn about the nation in this, in the, you know, in a nationalistic context. In addition, the teachers often, and we found also in our own practice, as well as the scholarship, um, that teachers and teacher candidates are often reluctant or resistant to examine their own relationship to global injustice um, and to those larger structures that we, I, alluded to in my last slide. In addition, we, we argue that it's imperative that education helps citizens and students learn about the world beyond the confines of their hometowns, beyond the confines of their nation. And that especially as the COVID, pan, COVID pandemic reiterated to all of us, in addition to current conflicts that I alluded to, that I mentioned earlier and the sustainability crisis, it reiterates to us the crucial interdependence that we all have, that an event happening in Ukraine can deeply affect the lives and real lived experiences of people, the world on the other side of the world. So in terms of our theoretical framework, we're not gonna to talk too much about this, but I'll just let you know that there were sort of three themes or frames that we are using in our work. The first one being critical and decolonial frame. Um, and we're very much influenced by the work of Delisavoy and also Linda Tuhiwai Smith. Um, and uh, the second theme being a collaborative and cross-national approach as you can see evidenced by our research team here today, um, and using the work of Yuval Davis, who talks about the need for transversal solidarity so that we find opportunities for collaboration and solidarity across difference. We recognize difference and we, and we wrestle with it overtly, but that it's also, um, we also find solidarity and collaboration across those differences. Um, and thirdly, that our, our project, obviously we do most of it over distance and virtually. So we are sort of posing this question to ourselves. What, what, what is the outcome of using this kind of format? And can we do meaningful, critical and decolonial work in this, in this space, in this virtual environment? So our research question is how, do we educate teachers and educators more broadly to develop a more critical and more decolonial approach to global citizenship education and embrace this commitment in their own work and their own practice? So as, as uh, Leanne has spoken to, these some many of the issues that we're trying to address and overcome, we're considering that global citizenship may be a good frame to be able to enter this sphere. Um, but we recognize the complexity and the contestedness of this 
notion of global citizenship. It's an emerging field and there are many scholarly debates within it. I mean, on one hand, you could place definitions like this Wikipedia definition for the idea of global citizenship. So the idea that all persons have rights and civic responsibilities, that we're members of the world with whole world philosophy and sensibilities, rather than a citizen of a particular nation or place, right? This sort of idealistic notion that we're members of all humanity and uh, resisting this idea of nationalism. But on the other hand, you will have uh, points like Prak the one Prakash makes here, the daring, dangerous arrogance of those who profess to be thinking globally, but also of the human impossibility of this form of thought. And so there's a certain arrogance that's associated with coming to understand a world uh, that is really impossible to understand it's all in all of its nuances and all of its localities. And to foreshadow our project, that's one reason why Ethiopia and Addis Ababa University, from the perspective of Canadian students, and also vice versa, is very interesting to, to zero in on another location to see one instance of, of particular nuances. So the field of global citizenship encompasses many dimensions and people think of different things when we think about global citizenship. Many of us think about the climate crisis and environmental concerns. Others look at the wealth gap, economics, poverty and hunger, inequality. Some of us are directed to thinking about foreign aid or uh, economics and, and fair trade and so on. Um, there's dimensions of human rights and so on. So you can see just by this diagram, all the interconnecting themes of global citizenship and the big um, uh, number of uh, items that are included under the umbrella of global citizenship as several authors have noted. But at the end of the day, global citizenship emerges in many local, provincial, national and international documents. So it tends, it's going to be something that educators grapple with and uh, come face to face with in teaching and education in different spheres. So at the bottom of this slide, for example, for those educators in, in um, Ontario, we will see this in various curriculum documents like the social studies curri curriculum in the Ontario curriculum that, that global citizenship helps prepare students um, that sorry that social studies helps prepare students to fulfill their role as informed and responsible global citizens. So right there, we know that our educators need to be able to grapple with this term. Um, likewise, in Ethiopia, some documents will be used from multilateral organizations like UNESCO, like UNICEF, and other multilateral organizations that invoke this term, and that. Um, education for uh, actually used directly. Um, maybe I'll pass this to you, Solomon, if you want to speak a little bit to the, to the way curriculum is generated in Ethiopia based on these multilateral documents. So yeah, basically uh, global, the, the concept of global order affects us in many ways. Uh, and the main, the main issue is that we, we basically don't own, uh, we, or we are not agents of our own transformation because of that uh, colonization of the mind. Uh, we almost pass uh, the button to the multilateral organization in terms of designing uh, our curriculum. Like uh, the latest example is that our uh, general curriculum, which is from pre-primary school, pre-primary to, 12th grade, which is a school living uh, stage, is being developed by the Cambridge International Consultants based in, in, the, in England. So we are simply uh, uh, passerby when uh, a curriculum is developed that affects our kids. And in that sense, uh, the curriculum can be said it has no relevance uh, whatsoever in terms of uh, building the capabilities to, to solve problems or understand social, understand and transform social realities. So one of the, as I mentioned earlier, this decolonization project is in helping teachers to 
not to be tools in this process that we become uh, ultimately agents of our transformations through education. Thank you, Gary. So we, um, to be able to get a bit more of a nuanced perspective on global citizenship, we Five use- Five words, pronounced wrong, two years before your brain starts shutting down. We'll use various frameworks. I'll just remind people if you can uh, keep yourselves on mute during this presentation. Except for yourself, Gary, now you're muted. Oh, okay. I think we all got muted. So, um, so we draw on various frameworks to try and raise the level of sophistication of how we look at global citizen uh, citizenship education. So um, there are many heuristics that are available to us and they become increasingly complex. Um, as a starting point, Vanessa Andriotti's work from almost 20 years ago now pits soft global citizenship education against critical global citizenship education and at least provides us with a sphere um, and a dialectic between looking at problems, the nature of the problem, the basis for caring, and grounds of acting for global citizenship a little bit differently. So what we've done is um, over the past year, we launched a pilot study um, based on putting some ideas together, of bringing two groups uh, of um, students together. So uh, we received a seed grant from the Faculty of Education at Lakehead University. And we ultimately brought together three students from three different places. So we had 23 participants, three universities in teacher education um, and graduate education students. So at Addis Ababa University, we had graduate edu education students. At Lakehead University, we had a course in comparative and international education that brought uh, graduate students uh, that Leanne taught. And then I brought a group of students from a global citizenship education course um, that were Bachelor of Education course uh, students. So we met together weekly in Zoom sessions. They were two hours each. And so we had our um, beautiful spectrum of faces on Zoom. Um, we had some direct teaching, we had um, breakout groups, um, we used various imagery and also photo voice that Leanne is going to talk to us about in, in a minute. Um, when, the, when the class, when the course was done, um, at the end of the course, we did some post-course interviews with various students to gain their perspectives on the experience, but also to try and sense how perspectives on global citizenship and particularly critical global citizenship had changed. So throughout the course, uh, um, we focused on mirroring these themes of pedagogy with methodology throughout uh, the experience. So there's this sort of dual um, trajectory that we, we run in terms of looking at how we're going to uh, encourage the learning in the course, but then also how we can use this as a research environment. We frame the pedagogy around global realities, global histories, global issues, and global actions, and then come to try to come to deeper understandings of global citizenship. So during this time, one of the key things we is we look at um, uh, re lived realities in each of our locations. And just foreshadowing some of the, the findings from our research, we see that these are some of the more interesting things that our students take away, some of these learnings about each of our nations. Um, so I wanted to invite Solomon and Leanne to speak a little bit about some of these uh, nuances and realities, some of the things we share about each of our countries to our students. So Solomon, did you want to start a little bit by expounding on Ethiopia here? So as, uh, as I thank you, Gary, as, as uh, shown in the, the slide, on the slide, Ethiopia has uh, the population of about 120 million, which is the second largest population in Africa next to Nigeria. Like the expectancy at birth is 65. It, it shows some uh, improvement from 
the previous few years. Uh, a high inflation, or currently there is a very high inflation, which ranges from 26% to 40%, uh, very large compared to many other countries. The GDP per capita in terms of US dollar is $925. Uh, you know, it's uh, the per capita product always uh, shows gross domestic product divided by media population, which also doesn't also indicate the social development index, which is also uh, very poor. And of course, as I said earlier, uh, the, the, there is 3,000 years of history in terms of statehood, but uh, unfortunately, we haven't utilized that that freedom into uh, physical freedom into uh, being free economically and socially. And so most of the, the activities, most of the budget, actually the government budget and uh, comes from the multilateral organizations like World Bank, UNESCO, UNICEF, and also bilateral uh, organizations like including the US and a uh, few European countries. Uh, over to you, Leanne. Thanks, Solomon. Um, oh, I see someone is trying to get in. Let me just admit them. Um, so as, as Gary and Solomon have mentioned, we um, found, our students found this very brief glimpse, almost snapshot of the two different contexts to be really quite interesting. Um, so we, of course, reminded them or um, talked about the fact that Canadian population by comparison was very small. We have a huge land mass, but a small population all along the border, the US-Canada border, um, that our life expectancy at birth is uh, 83, and that our consumer, our inflation is, is feels high for all of us with a $7 coffee from Starbucks. But in fact, compared again to 40% um, in Ethiopia is very low. Uh, that our GDP is 51,000 and that our history in terms of situating ourselves within the long landscape of our own history, that we only have 156 years as a nation state, but we have, of course, many thousands of years um, as an Indigenous community. And I'm just wondering if someone can take over letting people in while, while we carry on. Yes. Um, thanks. So I'm just going to talk briefly about photo voice. Can I just get a show of hands? Is there anybody in the audience who is familiar with photo voice? You can go to the Zoom menu and just put up your thumb to give me a thumbs up if you are familiar with photo voice. So let me just give you a moment to react. I'm going to invite some interaction at this moment. So go and give me a thumbs up if you're familiar with photo voice. So I see a few people who are who are familiar with photo voice, so that's wonderful. <laughs> I see one of our participants giving me a thumbs up, that's great. Um, so photo voice, for those who don't know, is in fact a research methodology. It is in fact a tool for participatory planning or community development. It is an approach to community development. In fact, I'm doing a training tomorrow on photo voice for an international organization. Um, it is also a pedagogy. It is also a pedagogical strategy that teachers or classroom educators can use in their work with students. And I know I see a couple of my students who are here. So I hope that um, that stimulates your thinking in terms of how you can incorporate into your teaching practice if you are a classroom educator. In terms of the key principles, um, I'm using the three C's, critical, creative, and collaborative. Um, and we use these in our in our conversation and our work and our project here on photo voice. So critical being, and my students from my critical literacy class will be very familiar with this, um, is making space for critical reflection on issues of power, position, privilege, and how macro structures of power affect the micro, affect our daily interactions with our colleagues, affect our interactions in the institutions and the structures in which we work. Um, participants lacking an organized political voice can perhaps use photo voice as a tool to organize their voice and have agency. Um, and also that photo voice is, instead of having research on people, that it is research with 
people, for people. Um, and we use the work of Harrison and Prosser and Burke to help us think through that. It is creative in that it is a visual methodology. So part of the analysis and part of the process is making sense of and making meaning of visual um, stimuli, including photos. And then finally, collaborative, that the last piece of photo voice is that, and I love this work by, um, quote by Michelle Fine, um, that participants are not just incidental to the curiosity of the researcher, but in fact, um, essential to the process of research and data collection and analysis. So how does it work? Here's a snapshot um, of how the process actually works. So number one, of course, is the relationship building. And how does that work? How do we establish rapport with and among all the participants in the, in the research process? Of course, a, 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 large, a large amount of planning, um, a, a con conversations about ethics and consent when you are taking images. Um, and then of course, if we have the ability to do this, some work on composition or visual principles. And then of course, the fun part where everybody gets to take photos um, on the particular theme that we have asked them to think about. And then we regroup and on Jamboard, um, we ask students to post their photos and write a very brief written reflection or explanation of why they chose the photo and how does it relate to the theme. And in fact, it is not going to save us time in analysis. It just adds another level of analysis because if we're doing a true photo voice, the participants will be involved in the analysis process of literally sorting the images and the conversations into themes. And then um, the research team will do the next level of analysis and, and work again, finally, with the participants to think about how to mobilize that knowledge. What do you want to do with that knowledge? Who do you want to get access to our conversations, to your data? Um, and often it ends up in some sort of public knowledge mobilization effort. It could be a photo exhibit, it could be presentations, it can be a variety of different ways. But that's at a snapshot, that is how the photo voice process can work. Ah, and just briefly, I'm not gonna talk about these too much, but you can see there's a wide range of photo voice uses from projects by Wang and Burgess, uh, Burris in with rural women in China. It, it's used in visual anthropology or visual sociology. It's used in health education. Um, Laura Lawrence uses it, um, has used it with brain injury survivors. Um, Claudia Mitchell has used it in Mozambique to with young girls um, for girls to share their um, reactions to a girl's education policy, which in my mind is a really radical use of this kind of technology that you actually get research, you actually get participants or quote unquote recipients of a process of a policy um, analyzing its effectiveness. So that's all I wanted to say about that. Thanks, Gary. Ah, our findings at a glance. So we're just gonna share with you all very briefly the, our initial observations and findings from our pilot study, which we conducted over the past year. And we'll take turns kind of talking through and showing you some of the photo voice uh, work that we did with our participants. Yeah, so what we'll do with this is I will go just very briefly through these kind of high level responses just to lay the landscape and we'll spend a little bit more time on the actual uh, photo voices um, to reflect the uh, the contributions and the analyses of the participants uh, according to the methodology that Leanne just spoke about. Um, one of our key questions in the post interviews were around current understandings of global citizenship since the end of the project. So when we spoke to participants at the end of the project, 
These were some of the things that they shared. So here's a sample of two participants in Ethiopia. The first participant saying global citizenship for me is understanding that globes, the common issues and the global, there are burning issues which affect our society, the globe in general, like global warming, epidemics, pandemics. You'll see the large areas highlighted, the large font highlighted on both sides, um, focusing on these themes of understanding others or different understanding being respected and accepted. And I like this uh, note at the bottom of participant one that's highlighted that says, so global citizenship is for me, knowing the problems and becoming part of the solution for that problem. So there's one perspective from, the, um, from several participants in Ethiopia from our pilot. And in Canada, there were some similar themes, but some students reflected these a little bit differently. So some of them talked about understanding differences. Um, a common theme that went out be, uh, that that uh, that was conveyed throughout our our project, because so much was new for our students and in both uh, in both senses. But this participant said, "I can understand differences. There are a lot of differences regarding our culture." regarding the systems, regarding the government policies, and so on. But you'll notice in uh, with participant two, the large area that's highlighted, the global citizenship to me would be a greater awareness of some of those cultures and being more attuned to your own biases and trying to incorporate other perspectives into yours. And I think this would be one of our uh, larger overarching hopes that we develop a greater sense of our of perspective awareness of our own biases of our own uh, lens on the world so now let's take a deeper look at some of these actual um, contributions of photos and how different students spoke to some of these photos uh, and how they uh, analyze them and so on so we'll start in Ethiopia and I'll pass to you, Solomon, to speak to this one. So generally the pictures and the conversations uh, from the Ethiopian students showed uh, a desire to be heard, to be known. So they were eager to share current conditions like whether bad or good, uh, their history and natural richness. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the many challenges facing the, the country uh, also part of uh, the situation in Africa. And of course, uh, not only the problems, as I said, there are good good stuff that the students were eager to share. Like, uh, uh, of course, we, we claim to be the origin of coffee, uh, which you take uh, daily or probably hourly. Uh, that was reflected uh, very much in the process. Uh, we have, you know, we also claim to have the Lucy, the first human skeleton that ever walked on us. Uh, uh, before like two, two million years ago. And some of the pictures in conversation also showed that despite the rich history and freedom, the current condition is so bleak that people are struggling for mere survival. Uh, there is lack of democracy uh, viewed from a transparent and accountable governance or lack of security, uh, for example, where most people live under a state of emergency or go home at 6 p.m. out of fear of being kidnapped. Uh, so, and also, uh, the, the, the school, you know, for example, one of the pictures you see on the number three, even though it was during COVID time and uh, the students have to, all over the, the globe, uh, students should have the mask to cover their face or, or, or breathing, which, is, which was very difficult. But basically it also shows that education is not really purposed or uh, organized to, to solve this problem. And I say, as I said earlier, there is literally nothing that uh, builds this problem solving capacity in the, in the curriculum. There is nothing indigenous knowledge. Until recently, there was no much indigenous knowledge. Everything is copied from the, let's say, from the, the Western model of education and the Western curriculum uh, being set by the international consultants. Even tertiary education has no any, any impact whatsoever on the on the problem uh, solving the country's problem. So the curriculum basically lacks uh, these capabilities, uh, in, including the idea of global citizenship. 
uh, so it's a mix of good and bad. Uh, uh, the idea, so as I said earlier, in the global citizenship education uh, and their aspiration, the students' aspiration, whether uh, in teaching and learning, was raising the consciousness of citizens of one global world, sharing both the problems and the solutions uh, together. And also, we don't want our teachers in the future to train to be. Uh, tools for colonial plants in action and to enforce uh, the unjust social order that keeps the poor poorer and the rich richer. And these were some of the, the pictures shared, uh, some of them taken directly, some of them, of course, uh, downloaded from the internet, which, which they felt will uh, express themselves through the photo waste uh, process. Uh, back to Gary. Yeah, that's also part of the, the explanation I gave earlier the good and the bad together. <laughs> oh, the, the other thing I might just add here is, as you notice, the one thing is in the corner, upper left corner is this idea that the media versus the reality, that what the media covers is different from the lived reality of most everyday people. And I think that's a theme that crosses through our presentation today, but also our project more broadly. Um, this last slide is another one of our Ethiopian participants. And um, as you can see, they mentioned how the war in Ukraine and Russia affects their daily lives by making things more expensive, making food more expensive, since Ukraine also provides food for the world. Um, in addition, this student also mentioned how gender inequality affects their daily lives. Um, and that was a theme brought up by several of our participants on both sides of the global north, global south divide. This is one of our Canadian participants um, who points out um, very, very, in a very detailed and thoughtful way about how global citizenship means being in solidarity with others around the world. And that, reminds me of my mention earlier of Yuval Davis's work of transversal solidarity, so solidarity across di difference, um, and also the our responsibility to the earth, to the natural world, beyond the human world, um, and how important it is for all of us to be involved in those efforts, um, as well as centering, centering our approaches and our indigenous perspectives in our work. Um, so we're sort of in the process at the moment of doing our initial observations and analyses of our pilot study. And very briefly, because um, I want we want to leave time for questions, but we also want to speak slowly enough so that our amazing translators <laughs> can do their important work. So I'll just touch briefly on our different populations of participants. So our Addis Ababa graduate students were all Ethiopian um, and reported that they had, this was a very rare opportunity for them to have this kind of exchange with international and Canadian students. And they also, um, uh, uh, then our Lakehead graduate students in my international education course were in fact all students of color um, and were all international students except for one that they also found this was a very rare opportunity for them. Um, they came from India, from China, from the Philippines, and that um, they had a, a very critical version of global citizenship in their, in their conversations that we had together. And finally, that our Lakehead teacher candidates um, found, uh, who were all um, Canadian uh, students, who were all happened to be white, and um, also found this was an incredibly rare and beautiful opportunity to connect with students from Ethiopia and around the world. And their um, concepts, of course, being younger than our graduate students, um, you might classify as a softer version of global citizenship education, one that was not infused with a more critical or decolonial perspective. So finally, I'm gonna pass our last observations slide to Solomon. So in this uh, learning and teaching process, of course, uh, we, we found out that 
I mean, the, the, the exchange may, may vary across the, the countries and across age group, but there is a desire to learn more about the other, to know, to understand better, which is also really a very critical uh, point in the global citizenship education process. And uh, from the Ethiopian side, we, need, we, we saw that there is a desire for more training with technology. And in fact, there was tutorial on how to use technology because there are a number of tech educational technologies. We may be familiar with one, but not uh, with the other. So uh, the process also took turns in, in terms of understanding what photo voice is, uh, how uh, Zoom, we're familiar with Google Meet, but not familiar with the Zoom. Uh, so there's a very interesting transfer of uh, knowledge and skill. And of course, uh, at the end, people suggested, everyone seems to be suggesting they have enjoyed the process, they have enjoyed the learning, and they, they want to have more. They want to engage more and more so that the, the, this understanding can expand. Uh, thank you, Leanne. No more. <laughs> now I'll pass back, uh, the ethical consideration back to you. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just mention and I'll pass it to you, Claudia, to speak about this, that we're we're on the um, on the forefront right now of a of a two year project uh, funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of of Canada, um, and so we're looking at uh, expanding and solidifying our our project. And so right now, looking at uh, um, developing a course in twenty twenty four. Dr. Ingram is going to Addis Ababa to uh, liaise in person with uh, Dr. Balai um, and everybody's students and do some training around photo voice. Uh, and at this present moment, we're looking at developing um, uh, our application for ethics in working with human participants. So, um, so we're laying this foundation and uh, we'll talk a little bit now about some of these considerations that we're noticing when we're developing the ethics. Thanks, Gary. So I had the chance to um, join the team this year and um, the things that we've been working on regarding the ethical considerations um, have involved uh, many discussions. Um, the, the main issues that we've looked at is about alternative data coll collection, um, for example, with images, um, and taking really into account what Alian was saying about the way we see participation, um, that students are engaged in their own analysis and how we can um, provide more um, support for, for them to bring it up. Um, we've also looked at recruitment and how uh, we could decolonize, we can decolonize um, in the recruitment and um, cover the diversity of representation. Um, also, uh, we have considered um, what does it involve to have incentives for participation, who would benefit from this participation and uh, well, the equity, the inequities um, that might be involved. Um, in, in the end, uh, we also have to look at the two different processes of um, ethics board in Canada compared to um, the ethics board in Addis Ababa. Um, I don't know if Solomon would like to mention anything on that. Oh yeah, just like the, the Canadian uh, version, we have uh, an ethics review board. I will uh, have to submit uh, the research, but of course it is not as strict or very stringent as uh, at the Canadian side. Uh, with, and also part of it is uh, that uh, uh, there is no uh, fear that there is a a health, health uh, problem. So it's purely, we treat it as an educational aspect. So we hope uh, the review be, would be uh, a bit easier one from the, the Canadian side, but still there is a, this process in place. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks, Solomon. Back to you, Gary. Sure, um, I can speak on this and I'll just invite anyone from our team to elaborate on any of these before we move to questions. But looking ahead, <clears throat> um, Part of the part of the importance or part of our focus is is to think about how we sustain this project. So, is this something that we can do over many years? I know there's sort of an interest on both sides to do to see how we could incorporate this on a on a yearly basis. 
um, dual ethnography. So using ethnography as a, as, as a methodology, but within our team as well. So what we haven't spoken about very much is the practices that we are doing with our students. We are trying to do with our research team as well. So uh, we are also doing our own photo voices. We're also collecting images. We're also looking at our own reflexology, uh, or sorry, reflexivity within, uh, within this process and also grappling with our own diverse positionalities with this team um, as well. We're thinking about extending the project into uh, different places. Um, Claudia has spoken about Merida in Mexico and as a possibility. Um, and there, it, it's, a, it's the kind of project that could be recreated and emulated um, elsewhere. And we continue to wrestle with uh, many things. Many of our research meetings are spent grappling with um, highly structural, um, uh, neo-colonial, neoliberal uh, issues that continue to emerge in internet internationalization of education. The language of the project is in English, right? How how can we get how can we work around that in any way? Um, Claudia already mentioned the equitable recruitment of students and participants. So some of the same themes that we see in education are reproduced in our project in terms of who participates and who has time and um, capacity to be able to participate. Uh, I already spoke about the positionality of our own team doing critical and decolonial work within institutions and in the histories and the Western and, and colonial histories of uh, education institutions, decolonization and indigeneity and, and thinking about those terms and how they differ and how we can um, and what our project is really about, really. And then deepening autoethnography and dual ethnography as methodology. So I'm going to um, uh, pass the mic to Leanne, who will conclude and, and with this quote and open us uh, to questions. I initially had a quote by the Filipino journalist, Filipina journalist, Maria Ressa, reminding us about the importance of taking, of strengthening our global institutions in the face of the dissolution of truth. Um, but I wanted to leave us off with something hopeful <laughs> instead of more depressing. And so I'm going to conclude with the words of a very of a very amazing young woman, American poet Amanda Gorman. Um, the poem that she read at the UN Secretary General, I mean the UN General Assembly last year. Um, and she says, um, how can I ask you to do good? when we barely withstood our greatest threats yet, this is the most pressing truth that our people have only one planet to call home and our planet has only one people to call its own. We can either divide and be conquered by the few or we can decide to conquer the future and say that today a new dawn we wrote, say that as long as we have humanity, we will forever have hope. And I think this is a nice way to conclude our conversation today. And uh, we'd love to open it up for questions and comments. So feel free to put your questions in the chat or you can go to the Jamboard that um, Gary shared earlier and ask um, your questions or post your comments or suggestions. We're also open to um, conversations with you all about how to extend this work and deepen it. Um, so thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. Um, yeah. And I'll just pass the mic to Solomon to add. No, I just uh, part of the conclusion, we were also exploring how the world is shrinking in many ways uh, at a global village. And we know that also that popular phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. Now the question is how can we raise a, a global child in such a way that everyone feels uh, below Oh, no. Oh. Hopefully, and hopefully Solomon comes back here. But um, this, I we should note, we were very lucky this morning in in our international Zoom call to be able to all come together. This is uh, one issue that we struggle with to some degree in this in this project. Um, I we've got some things on the Jamboard. I think that could begin our que our questions. Um, I can't really see 
if people have hands up or not. Actually, I can see, and I see that nobody, there, there isn't anybody with their hand up right now, but if somebody wants to put their hand up, then we can prioritize your voice. Um, I will share the screen here of the Jamboard, but as I'm pulling that up, I'll also just remind people that uh, I realize we have a lot of students here from Addis Ababa University, from University of Toronto, from Lakehead University as well. And so we uh, also wanted to use this presentation as a bit of a recruitment tool. And so if you're interested in participating in this project in, in this winter, please reach out to uh, your various instructors to, uh, to speak to us to see how we can uh, set you up with that. Also, Gary, do you mind just resharing the link? I, I just thought maybe there might be some people who are new and they don't have that link. Absolutely, yeah. So we have, um, while I'm sharing the link, we have some really um, profound questions here, I think, and points. So the first one, media versus reality differ, but realities of the same situation can also differ. The second mm -hmm. one, uh, I'm just going to enlarge this so people can see. What were commonalities or differences shared between groups on gender discrimination? The point that Dr. Mm -hmm. Inger made. And how do you deal with asynchronous knowledge between global citizens in different global sites? Solomon, I just read the questions here on the Jamboard that people have posted. Um, for everybody else, I put the link to the Jamboard in the chat. Hopefully you saw that. So if you want to post another question or a comment or even a response, feel free to do that. But maybe I could open it up to the team if there's a question, uh, if there's one of these questions that anyone would like to respond to. Sure. Um, I can refer to the first one um, about commonalities or differences shared between groups on gender discrimination. Um, this is an ongoing struggle that we are all dealing with, not only with our participants, but also in our team. Um, the, it kind of speaks to the larger question about how do we do this kind of critical work and decolonial work within the structures and institutions that are based on a traditional or colonial <laughs> or um, uncritical, like I use the word, I, use, I always think of Audre Lorde, the Black American poet, an activist, uh, can you use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house? Um, do we have to exit the house in order to um, in order to make an impact? Um, I think uh, that's a really profound question, um, and I don't know if their commonalities are. But I think, interestingly, in terms of the dynamics, I think um, they were shaped quite a lot by age and by experience and um, by culture. Um, in terms of cultural differences about who felt comfortable to speak up and under what circumstances and in what context that um, often in my initial observations, it was ironically, it was often the young, um, younger participants, the Canadian white younger participants who felt quite comfortable sharing and occupying space. Um, and so that was an interesting an interesting dynamic, but thank you for that question. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to add and maybe we take up the next question as well. Can I just add really quick and then I might uh, invite Solomon to add too, because um, uh, I mean, one general theme, I mean, in, in the history, much history in international relations involves like um, people and institutions from the global North instructing or teaching people from the global south what to do right or how to do it and education is rife with this this kind of um these practices that we continue to see today and and solomon you mentioned that at the beginning of the presentation around unesco and and the the policies multilateral policies informing uh, national curriculum and so on but i think we even see this in our work Right, so there are these long-held biases of 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 young people and old people in um, people of all ages in Canada, thinking that this project is about um, instructing people in Ethiopia about what citizenship is or what education is, and so and those are those can be very very subtle, right? And it's also reflects language. It goes back to the language of the project and the and fluency of language and what 
language we hold this project in. Solomon, do you want to expand on that as well or comment on, on that? I know you've had a lot to say about that in the past as well. No, basically you, you said it well. And uh, uh, I think that is also the ultimately the object of global citizen education or decolonizing education because since childhood we have been told a certain way of conforming to a Western standard through not only through education, but through Hollywood movies and all others. So we have abandoned our culture, our tradition, our language. And so we have neither become the waste nor our service like it has become a lost. If you remember uh, in describing our service, you know, I see self-hate, you know, uh, lack of true identity. So how do we now through conversation, through engaging that our voices are heard, are, are, are we being recognized in this global order? And then finally, uh, I mean, like, how do we uh, integrate ourselves within the system of unity while there is also diversity. That was a, a challenge to be at least uh, very, very soon in this, in this upcoming course. Thank you. <laughs> a message that our, our time is up here and just to honor the uh, other presentations that are, that are coming, maybe what we'll do is we'll stop here. But if, you, if anybody would like to have further discussion around the questions we didn't get to, or about collaborating with this project or joining this project in one way or another, please reach out to, uh, to any of us. And if you don't have our contacts, I think um, the DCMET uh, team at UNESCO could help facilitate that. So, merci beaucoup, miigwech, amas signalo. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, enjoy I'm the sorry, day. No. <laughs> Gracias. Thank you very much to our presenters as well for a wonderful session and a lot for us to think about moving forward. Thank you to our interpreters and also to everyone who joined us this morning and hope that you will continue to join the rest of the symposium.